If you'll take your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to start off there, and you can put your finger there, and then turn to Exodus chapter 34, and put your finger there. First Corinthians chapter one, verse nine, excuse me, verse nine. First Corinthians chapter one, verse nine. If you'll stand as we read a portion of God's word. First Corinthians chapter one, verse nine, God's word says, God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We'll turn to Exodus chapter 34. <clears throat> well, background, uh, this is when, this is when uh, uh, God is appearing, or Moses has asked God to reveal his glory to him. God said, I'm going to hide you in a cleft of the rock and pass before you, and you can see my back. This is Exodus chapter 34, starting at verse 6, well, verse 5. Then the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, God, favor, God favor, the Lord, the Lord, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. He who keeps... And loving kindness to, th to thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, and he will by no means, but yet he will know by, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. So is written the word of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you for this day. May the Holy Spirit lead us into your truth. May he take the words that I utter and make them his own, make them his own. And may he lead us uh, into the truth of your word. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're seated, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. How many of you in this past um, past week or so has, has said to themselves, it can't get any worse than this? I have sometimes, you know, it, it gets pretty bad. Yet I think, you know, we still have more to go. But I'd like to read a portion, of, you don't have to turn there, to Amos. I'd like to por read a portion of Amos. It, it just gets me this drips with irony and, and sort of a... Uh, that it can get worse. Amos chapter 5, and this is out of the New Living Translation, by the way. Uh, it says, Moses chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. What sorrow awaits you who say, Oh, if only the day of the Lord were here. You have no idea why you're at, what you are wishing for. That day will be darkness, not light. And that day you will be like a man who runs from a lion only to meet a bear. Escaping from the bear, he leans his hand against the wall of his house, where he, and he is bitten by a snake. Yes, the day of the Lord will be dark and hopeless without a ray of hope. I often think of that passage, you know, that, that poor guy. I can see these guys in overalls dressed under porch, you know, doom, and I see, what is it? Uh, oh, you know, the old hee-haw thing, you know, doom and despair and agony on me, deep, dark depression, just... And he says, you know, in that day you'll be like a man who runs from a lion only to meet a bear, escaping from the bear. He leans his hand against the wall of his house and he's bitten by a snake. <laughs> some days are like that, isn't it? I just think some days it gets pretty bad when you're at the end of your rope. Yeah, I, I've, I've had those days. Um, David had those days too. David had those days too. If you'll remember, does, does the name of the city Ziglag mean anything? David's 
Yeah, it was his home for a while, wasn't it? Why did he move there? Hiding from Saul. Yeah, he was hiding, but more than that, I think he was a little bit depressed. Um, chapter 27 of 1 Samuel, back up a little page. He says, you know, he says to David, then David says to himself, now I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me to escape into the land of the Philistines. What was wrong with that? Yeah, yeah, he didn't get it from God, did he? Yeah, and the Philistines were his enemy. And so, you know, it, it tells us, it tells us in, the, in, the, in those chapters 27 28 how, how he went to Ziglag. And he talked to the, you know, the head honcho there. And, uh, well, he went to a different town, but he went to talk to the head honchos, and they gave him Ziglag as a, as a city. And what, what did David do there? Anybody know? Well, basically, he went on a rampage. Yeah. He lied. He, he, his boss, you know, the, the, the Philistine he was under, uh, he lied to him all the time. He went out and destroyed people. He destroyed all these people in the town. Didn't leave one person alive to tell, the, to tell what he did. And he did that for several months. Um, and and uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was slaughtering people. He was slaughtering whole towns and taking their money, taking everything, all their possessions. We were not leaving one thing left on you know, one stone to tell what he had done. Um, it was pretty bad. I think that's one of the reasons uh, um, some people say that this time in Ziglag disqualified him for building the house of the Lord. Uh, in Second Chronicles chapter um, is it 28, yeah, 28, it says, uh, But God said to me, Thou shalt not build my house for my, for, uh, to my, for my name, because you are a man of war and have shed blood. See, what David did wasn't by, from the Lord. It wasn't his will that he slaughtered these people. But David went out and slaughtered, killed them. Men, women, boys, girls, babies, took all their possessions. Now let me ask you, what kind of person would do that? What kind of person would sign up to do that? Probably pretty bad, wouldn't you think? It would attract the dregs of society, those people who were maybe not devoted to God. So let's pick up the story in, in chapter 30 of, Zig, of, of uh, 1 Samuel. Chapter 30. Uh, in the meantime, David had been turned down from going to uh, the Philistines, joining the Philistines in their fight against Israel. God didn't permit that for, for David. But it says when, in chapter 30, he sent home, by the way, then it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the on Negev and on Ziglag and had overthrown uh, Ziglag and burned it with fire. They took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without anyone killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. When David and his uh, men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept, and there was no strength left in them to weep. Now David's two wives had been taken, uh, had taken captive. Um, I won't begin to pronounce the first name. Uh, the Jezreelites and Abigail, the son of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people who were embittered, each one because of his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You see, David and his men, these hardened warriors, men who had blood on their hands, killed people. They did it for a living. But when, they, when the tales are reversed, what did they do? They wept. They wept. He's overwhelmed with grief, David and his men. He had been attacked, the city had been attacked and destroyed, and everyone in it taken captive. Everyone who wails, uh, everyone waits, wails. The tables have been turned on David, and they don't like it. 
In fact, they're so mad, they was afraid they're going to stone him to death because they wanted to. So what did David do? Yeah. He turned to the Lord, his God. Finally, David is, is forced to, to uh, admit his wrong, I think. Even though it doesn't say so, he turned to the Lord, his God. He remembered that God was his, uh, his Savior. I mean, in other words, he couldn't have written words like that in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, he remembers the promises of, like Nahum. Of course, Nahum comes later, but I think these promises apply. Nahum didn't learn them by himself, and, and David knew these things. A strong refuge when trouble comes, and he is close to those who trust him. David remembered the promises of, uh, of Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. God is merciful. God is forgiving. God is faithful. Does God ever change? No. He's immutable. He can't change. He won't change. David had to remember that, didn't he? God had to bring him up short. David had had his way for a long time, for months. But when the tables were turned, he had to find his hope in God again. I mean, David thought that it couldn't get any worse than this. What does he do Versus, verse, uh, after verse 7? Then David said to Abathar, the priest, the son of Elimelech, priest bringing the ephod. So Abathar brought, brought it and, and the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I purchase, uh, pursue this band? Shall I overtake him? And he said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and I will surely rescue all. Isn't that amazing? God had promised David something. Um, David found his strength in God. He was a shepherd. Um, but also God had to provide. Uh, he goes on and says, um, So David went, and he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook of Bezor, who, the, who's, who were left, those, where those who were left behind remained. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 were too exhausted to cross the brook of Bezor and remain behind. You see, they pursued, because God told them to, didn't he? What if God had, had promised you that? I mean, everything was gone, everything was taken. God says, go ahead and pursue. Now, we don't have, know how many of the Amalekites were, were there, but they were obviously a bigger band, probably. But he said, pursue them. How many people does it take for God to work through people? Um, let's see, what was it? Uh, Ab Abraham went and rescued Lot with how many men? Was it about 300 or something? Maybe less than that? How many, how many here, here's an easier question, how many people uh, did Gideon need? Did God need, let Gideon have? Yeah, not very many, did he? How many showed up to begin with? Wasn't it over 30,000, something like that? Whittled them down to 300? That's a big deal. 300 men against a whole, a whole army. How many men did Jehoshaphat need? We talked about that a couple weeks ago. How many, men, how many men did Jehoshaphat need to defeat the Lord? None. Zero. Zip. Because God did the fighting. The battle was the Lord's, wasn't it? So he doesn't need us, but he can show us his way. He uses us. But he still shows us his way. So God's providence is always necessary, isn't it? Look at verses 10 through 11, or 10 through 20, excuse me. But David pursued, and he and the 400 men, 200 were left behind. They, they were too exhausted to find, go on. Now they found, uh, they found an, an Egyptian in the fields. Uh, and brought him to David and gave him bread and he ate and he provided him water to drink. And they gave him a piece of fig, fig cake, two, rash, two clusters of raisins, and he ate. And his spirit was revived and he had, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong and where are you from? 
And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite, and my master let me, left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. We made a, a raid on the, on the Negev of the Cherites, and on that which belongs to Judah, on the Negev of Caleb, and we burned the Ziklag with a fire. Then David said to him, will you bring me down to this land? And he said, sure, swear to me by God that you will not kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring him down to this band, and I will bring you down to this band. And when he had brought them down, behold, they were spread over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that had been taken from the land of Philistines and from the land of Judah. David slaughtered them with a, and from the twilight of the evening until the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who made their, who rode on donkey, camels and fled. So David recovered all the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives, but nothing of theirs was missing, when, whether great or small. Sons or daughters to spoil and anything that they had taken for themselves, David brought it all back. So David captured all the sheep and all the cattle which the people had drove ahead of them and other livestock, and they said, this is David's spoil. What an interesting turn of events, isn't it? I mean, David is pursuing these people, and if you look three days, three days back, it's about when David started back. And this young man, God had to provide for him, provide him for David. He got sick three days ago and happened to be there when David ran upon him and told him about the Malachites, the, the people. I'm sure there was a lot more that he told them. So God provided that young man, didn't he? That's, you know, just wasn't by accident, it was by provision. God's sovereign. Um, God's provision is necessary in our lives, even though we don't rescue, we even don't know it, even when we don't know it. Um, God has provided us with a, a great country to live in, hasn't he? He's blessed us greatly with a lot of freedoms. God didn't have to do that. God didn't have to have you born in this country, but he chose to. And what are we to do while we're here? Aren't we, aren't we to be salt and light in this world? Yeah. And I think David finally realized that. He found this young man, and he asked him these questions. Uh, and, and God provided all this. And you know what else he provided? I think what's amazing, even more amazing to me, is God um, provided that his family and all his possessions remain intact. Yeah. What was David doing before all this happened? He was, what, attacking and destroying all his neighbors, hiding it, uh, taking all their possessions. But here God provides that everything was saved. Nothing was taken. That just amazes me. That's just, because uh, what happens in war? I mean, things get destroyed. People take things. People usually rape women or destroy babies. Yet not one person, not one lamb or sheep were told survived or was killed. They all survived. I think that's just amazing. I mean, you know, we, we just can't foresee that. We just can't fathom that. David acknowledges God's grace in these next chapters. They're headed back to Ziklag. And David came near to the, when David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David, those who had been left behind at the brook of Belzor, they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And David approached the people and greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men among those who went with David said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except to every man and his wife uh, re recovered, except to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and escape. Then David said, "You must not be like, not so, my brothers. For what, with uh, excuse me, with what the Lord has given to us, who has kept us and delivered us to the hand of uh, hand of the." Uh, 
who has given to us, who has kept us and delivered us into the hand of, hand, of, of the land who came against us? And he, and who will listen to you in this matter? For his share is too great for him to go down to battle, so his share shall be like the one who goes to share, they shall share alike. That's what God did, didn't he? How did David respond to God? Didn't he respond with thanksgiving? Didn't he thank with acknowledging God's grace and mercy? For what did David deserve? What did David deserve there? Yeah, he deserved punishment, didn't he? I think he did. Before this, when he was a killer, he was a murderer, he had blood on his hands. He deserved nothing. And God was gracious and granted him mercy and grace. This battle was fought with grace, with the grace of God, the gift of God. We often think of grace as, as that free unmerited gift, and this is a free unmerited gift. Undeserved, unearned. God's victories in our lives will be an example to others. What if David had said, you know, well, those 200 men, they didn't go with us, so just give them their wives and their basic possessions and send them on their way. What are those 400 men that thought that, that, that did that? What about the 200 men that were left behind? We did this. You know, I think they would have seen that the, the, the 400 that did that went with David and said, we did this. We did this ourselves. It's not our power. But David says, no, it's by the grace of God that you did this. It's the grace of God that provided all this. That free unmerited gift. God gave David the victory, but he did not earn it. He did not deserve it. But God miraculously preserved what had been taken and given him victory over his enemies. And when they see that, us giving thanks to God for what he's given to us, it encourages them and gives us standing among them. Too often we, we are criticizing everybody. Too often we are uh, too busy in our own woes to realize the grace of God. But God is always gracious. He's always faithful. Someone wrote, God's faithfulness even to the imperfect man magnifies his faithfulness in the case, in, and in the case of Christ, the perfect king. But he got, he, God manifests his, his, his uh, grace toward people even when they don't deserve it, even though they're faithless. Uh, what does it say in 2 Timothy 2 or 3, something like that, 13? When, God, when we are faithless, God is faithful yet. He's always, he can't change. He's always faithful. He's always grateful. He's always gracious and he's always loving. God will always be true to himself and his words, even though we remain faithless. And I think that's the thing we can learn about this passage, is that God is faithful in all that he does, even when we don't deserve it. But we will come to recognize that God's uh, work in our lives. Um, we need to recognize that ourselves. And it's by the grace of God that we have the freedoms that we have. It's by the grace of God that we are not persecuted like our brothers and sisters in Christ in China, where God's grace, that we are not persecuted like those Christians, our brothers and sisters in Iraq and Iran. They, lost, they lose their lives. They can lose their life every day. They recognize that all things that God does is, is in his faithfulness. It's done in faithfulness with love and mercy. David had to learn that lesson. And he learned it the hard way, I think. You see, David had a, a wrong conception or lost his, his idea, his... his um, He lost who, who God was by his depression, by his distress, his discouragement, and his killing. See, God is always faithful. 
A.W. Tozer wrote, it is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right when, when, we, when our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate. And that's what David had, didn't he? He, had a, he, had, he took his eyes off the Lord and looked out upon all that had happened to him. What do you say back in verse 20, uh, verse 20, chapter 1? Verse 27, chapter 1, excuse me, of, of Samuel. Listen to those words again. Then David said to himself, Now I will perish one day ahead by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me to do than to escape into the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of searching for me anymore in all the territory of Israel, and I will escape from his hand. You see, David had been chased everywhere by Saul. David forgot about the miraculous uh, rescue of Saul a couple times. David was discouraged and depressed, but God was faithful, wasn't he? Who else remembers uh, someone who was depressed after a great victory on Mount Carmel? Elijah. He killed 400 prophets of Baal after God burned, it, uh, burned you know, sent lightning out of the sky or, or fire out of the sky, whatever you want to think about that, and burned up the offering and the altar, and, which was made of rock and, and the water. And then Elijah despaired, didn't he? He took his eyes off God and looked at who? Jezebel. Yeah. A woman scorned, I guess, would you say? Yeah. A woman scorned. You see, he looked at, he took his eyes off God and looked at Jezebel. And what did Jezebel say? You know, she said, the Lord, you know, are, if you live another day, Elijah, it's not because I didn't try to kill you, basically. Paraphrasing her. What did Elijah do? Yeah, he ran like a scared rabbit. God provided him some food along the way. He ended up in Mount Carmel, didn't he? Or, yeah, Mount, well, Mount Sinai, what we think is Mount Sinai. Somewhere in there. But he's taken his eyes off the faithfulness and provision of God, didn't he? Yeah. What did Jonah do when God told him, you go to the Ninevites? Go to your enemies, the Ninevites, you know, those nasty people up there, northern, the northern part of the Fertile Crescent. Go up there, be a witness to them. What did Jonah do? He ran like a scared jackrabbit. Ran up to Tarshish, tried to get on a boat and sail away. Of course, the Lord changed all that, didn't he? Great fish swallowed him and then vomited up on the land, and then Jonah, Jonah went, didn't he? What happened then? The Ninevites repented, didn't they? And Jonah goes, you know, I told you so, God. I told you they're going to repent. You're too gracious. You're too loving. You're too kind. And God said, you know, raise up a plant and gave, gave him some shade because it was very hot. And then he cut, had an insect come by and cut down the, the shade. And Jonah complained again. And God says, shall I have mercy on you? Or what's, what's, what's the matter? Having mercy on 250,000? 250, 250,000 people? Shouldn't I send a witness to them as well as you? How about Peter? What did he do when it, comes, when it came time and someone asked him, are you a disciple of Jesus? Yeah, he denied the Lord three times, didn't he? He didn't deserve anything. But God had compassion on him. God was faithful. God was true to his word. God showed him mercy and grace. I guess a new light to that little phrase by uh, that, that statement by A. W. Tozer says, "It's impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inner attitude right, while our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate." Who do you think God is? That's a question I posed a couple of weeks ago. 
Who is your God? Is he faithful? Is he just? Is he righteous? Is he immense and holy? Is he merciful? Is he eternal? Is he the faithful God, the sovereign God, the wise God, the one God? Is he imminent? Is he transcendent? Is he perfect? Is he holy? Is he omniscient? Is he omnipotent? Is he omnipresent? Who is your God? Have you become, become discouraged a little bit about the world and what's happening? And I suggest that we turn our eyes upon Christ once again. He is the author and perfecter of our faith because he is a faithful one. He didn't leave David all alone out there in, in the wilderness. He didn't deny David and say, I'll raise up another king. He just had to remind David of who he was. And David had forgotten that, I believe. How often do we need reminders about who God is? Who is your God? Is he the faithful one, the righteous one? Or is he somebody, you know, you just put him in a box and take him down off the shelf, like I said before, and you drop a few slots, a few pieces of coin to the slot on the top of it and say, well, I need you now, Lord. Most of the time I'll go my own way, but you know, this, this situation is a little bit difficult for me, so I need, I need, to, I need a little bit of extra help. You can't change, uh, you know, I, I, I can say something about the, no, the, the current political uh, climate, but you can't change people by changing politics. You can only change people. God is the only one who can change people and change their hearts. And that's not to mention that we can't be politicians because there are Christians and they're needed in politics. But we can't put all our hope in, in politics. At the end of uh, probably the greatest conservative politician or president that we've had in the last half a century, maybe, Ronald Reagan. Was the practice of abortion overturned by the time he left office? Nope. Did he have the budget under control when he left office? No. You see, if we put our trust in people, they're bound to fail us. But if we put our trust in God and hold on to that faithfulness, hold on to his faithfulness, we'll never be discouraged. And, you know, we can talk about a lot of things, you know, and, and who's your focus on? Who is it on? Is it upon your God? How, and David had to learn the hard way, I think. But God provided very, uh, a lot for him. God is faithful. And he will deliver us from whatever he puts us through. He will give us the strength to carry on. You know, God is immense. He's, he's infinite. That means we can't escape from him. Psalm 139 says, you know, if I go, go even to hell, there you were there. I go up to the highest heavens, you were there. You know me. God knows you infinitely well. And he's immense. Do you know, do you know understand what that means, the word immense? It means like if you went to the ocean over here and take a cup of water out, that ocean would be as full as it ever was except for that one cup, right? If, you, if, if God's immenseness were, were that ocean and you dipped your cup in it, it wouldn't diminish him one bit. He doesn't lose power. He doesn't gain power. He doesn't love more. He doesn't love less. He doesn't grant mercy more than to one more than another. His mercy never decreases, never ends. 
God is God. One of my favorite hymns is, um, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, I will sing. With my mouth I will make known thy faithfulness and thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness to all generations. We saw that, sang that last week, didn't we? Yeah. Great is thy faithfulness this is another one of my favorites. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. At Calvary, that's another powerful song. Mercy there, when great was, uh, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Could we with ink the oceans fill, and every man ascribed by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry? Nor could the scrolls contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That comes from a song called The Love of God. You see, God is God. God is faithful and trusting. God is faithful and trustworthy. God is powerful. How is that? We, we, well, when I was in, well, before seminary, but Bible college, we had to write down a, an attribute of God on a three by five card. Pick whatever one you want uh, holiness, uh, God's merciful, God's faithfulness. But you just wrote down on one side of the card, the three by five card, and he flipped it over. Then you were supposed to write how that attribute of God had impacted your life and your living. So we can say God is faithful, or God is holy, or God is righteous, or God is just, or God is all-powerful, God is sovereign. But then we had to translate that. How does it, how does it affect your life? How does that attribute of God that that he, you know, those attributes aren't something that he has, or it's something he is. But how does that attribute affect your life? How does God's faithfulness, what, is, what does that mean to you? How have you seen it in a practical way displayed in your life? You know, God says, be holy because I am holy. How has that impacted your life? What does that mean? How have, you, how have you experienced that in your life? God is faithful. How have you experienced that in life? How have you had to trust in him? David had forgotten that little secret. But God reminded him. Of course, David's just like us. You know, we, many times he had to learn that lesson over and over again. Uh, and he, had, he, had, he did some things that I wouldn't do. But still, that didn't make him more of a sinner than I am. And I think that's the biggest thing. God is faithful who called us into fellowship with, his Lord, with our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who called us into fellowship with his Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. God is faithful to me because he called me into fellowship with his, our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful to me because he called me into fellowship with my Lord Jesus Christ. Let's keep that in mind this week. Let's try to focus on him and all that we say and do. May our actions reflect our commitment to him. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this time we've had together. And Lord, uh, I know my words are inadequate, my thoughts. But I pray the Holy Spirit would have spoken to each heart here, that we might grow in our knowledge and, and commit ourselves to following you in all things. 
Father, I pray that you would just uh, minister to us today. And may we take into account uh, your faithfulness and your love and your mercy and your grace and the peace that we have that passes understanding. May we keep our eyes focused on the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the Father. Father, you are good, and you have been good to us. Help us to see your faithfulness in everything, and your love, and your mercy, and all that you are, all the time. And see, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.